Hey everyone, it's Mark. Today's episode is sponsored by Paint Care. Paint Care is the industry's own solution for the problem of post-consumer paint waste. The organization has already collected over 50 million gallons and redirected them from landfills and waterways. Paint Care currently operates in 10 states and the District of Columbia with New York, the 11th state, coming online in May of 2022. Paint Care is both good for the environment and your business. 35% of dealers who sign up to be a Paint Care drop-off location report new customers shopping in their store as a direct result of their participation in Paint Care. To learn more about Paint Care, go to paintcare.org forward slash retailers. <laughs> Hey, everybody. Thanks for joining me today. It's Mark. With me today on my episode is Allison Dowell. Allison is the president of Emory Jensen. Emory Jensen, as we know, is the distributor of paint and sundry products in our channel. They're also very big in the hardware channel, as well as in the lumber channel. In fact, I, I believe that paint and decorating dealer is the smallest to Emory Jensen uh, of those channels after my conversation with Allison. But Emory Jensen is a wholly owned subsidiary of ACE. That's the cooperative that is ACE hardware stores. And so they are really important in our space. They're a very large player, Emory Jensen. That makes Allison's perspectives on our industry really interesting to me. And so we prepared a couple of really good questions for Allison to get into and really talk about some of the things that are impacting dealers right now. Of course, we spent some time talking about what's going on with the supply chain and Allison's insights into that really will help dealers understand sort of what they can expect in the coming months and years. It sounds to me like sort of the time that we're experiencing right now is is likely to be with us for a little while. And that's bad news, of course, dealing with things like your fatigue associated with what it takes to purchase and run your stores, what it takes to do your purchasing and some of the other issues that dealers are currently facing with. That's the downside. But the upside, of course, is that dealers are busy and it, it sure looks like they're going to remain that way for the foreseeable future. So Allison and I get into some of that. We spend a lot of time digging into the issues associated with the supply chain, as well as other issues that are on dealers' minds. And so give a listen tune in. She's actually going to be on again in a couple of months. And so I'm looking forward to uh, you guys spending a little time with Allison and getting to know a key executive in our space. So thanks everyone for joining me today. With me today on my program is Allison Dowell. Allison is the president of Emory Jensen. Allison, how are you this morning? Doing well, thank you. Good morning. Good morning. Thanks for being on. So for those who don't know, Emory Jensen is a wholly owned subsidiary of ACE. Is that right? Right. We're a relative newcomer to the wholesale distribution space. We were created through ACE acquiring two regional distributors, Emory Waterhouse up on the East Coast and Jensen Bird on the West Coast. And so we brought those together and formed Emory Jensen. And now we're a nationwide distributor about uh, five years into this. And so tell me, how did you end up being the president of Emory Jensen? Sure. Well, you know, my career, I started in hardware actually uh, right out of college in Connecticut on a receiving dock of a Home Depot store back when Home Depot was a small little 200 and some store chain. In my uh, hometown, I think you mentioned in Stamford, in, Connecticut. Uh, or Orange, Connecticut. Yep. Oh, yep. there you go. The yeah. city that works. Go Stamford. Yeah. Oh, yeah. Orange. Okay, close orange. enough. We'll, we'll claim you. We'll claim you. <laughs> I opened up a number of, uh, at, at that point in Home Depot's uh, maturation, they were growing very rapidly. So I o- opened up a number of the stores in, in Connecticut. But I spent about six years in stores, uh, moved out to St. Louis and was down in Texas, opened up a couple additional markets for Home Depot and then got into merchandising. So my first tour of duty with Home Depot was about 12 years. I left and, and I ended up leading sourcing for Target Corporation for the home portion of the store. So if you like any of the occasional tables or task lighting or, or decorative accent pillows, that would have been my team that was sourcing those. And then I came back to Home Depot as they acquired a B2B company really focused on multifamily housing, some institutional spaces, and led merchandising again for Home Depot, kind of on my second tour. 
And that's when Ace made the acquisitions of these companies. And so they were looking to take these companies that they had been running independently with Emory and Jensen. They ran them independently for a couple of years, and they were really at a point where they wanted to figure out how to build one company, be able to leverage the entire Ace enterprise when it comes to the the distribution centers, 15 distribution centers we have across the United States. So I came up to uh, help with the integrations and the migrations and and lead that formation of Emory Jensen. And then about two years ago, I was was named president. So they couldn't do it without you is basically what they said. Well, I wouldn't say that. I've got a fantastic team. And and really, you know, one of the things that's special about our company is that we have, you know, this, this large umbrella of being part of the ACE family, but we've got this kind of scrappy, gritty, entrepreneurial spirit of the folks that we brought over from Emory and Jensen. So we've got a, a team that is just so passionate about the hardware and paint business, really focused on customers. You know, we value tremendously the communities that our customers work in, that live in, in, in the support and the work and the, the, the give back that they do within each of their communities. And so that's such an important part of kind of the fabric of who we are. So now this is this is definitely a team sport. And, and my, my team is just absolutely incredible, dedicated, hardworking folks. Well, I'm looking forward to hearing about some of the work that you guys are doing. We had prepared, you know, a conversation for us to have today. If you don't mind, let's jump right into it. Sounds good. So I'd mentioned before, Allison, moving on, I'd mentioned before a dealer that had told me how much his business was up over 50% of the year. And, and most dealers I'm speaking to, although that is a bit high, most dealers I'm speaking to are seeing very robust double digits almost in all cases, increases across the, across the channel. What is driving that demand right now, in your opinion? We've really learned a lot over the past couple of years. And one of the things that I would challenge so many of us that saw success over the past couple of years is making sure that we're growing our share and that we're growing overall unit sales and not just thinking about the dollar standpoint. Because right now, you know, with inflation the way it's been going, you can see double digit comp sales without seeing more units go through through the register and so or conversely you could see up from a from a dollar standpoint and be down uh lose some market share so that certainly inflation is something that is driving you know the 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 cost of a gallon of paint now compared to where it was two three years ago is significant but then there's just almost insatiable demand for products out there. Even before the pandemic, I think what we were seeing a backlog in new housing starts. And so we knew that there would be enough demand for new homes that exceeded the ability for the industry to actually get those constructed that was going to you know, fuel this, this business for many years. Interesting. So this was coming anyway. I think it was coming anyways. I think we were already starting to kind of see that 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 um, that need to fill the gap. And then and 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 labor was a challenge even before the pandemic, right? We already were talking about uh, getting more people into the trades and how do we get young people not just going the college route, but actually getting involved in in building uh, industry. And and then you know with the change in how Americans feel about living in uh, cities and how they feel about um, rentals versus home ownership and those kinds of things. I think through the pandemic, a lot of that change hasn't done anything to slow this or, or to quell this demand for this excess demand for, for housing. And if anything, um, it's accelerated it, I would say, right? It's accelerated it. So, so that demand's gone up. The labor continue, you know, has gone, has been even uh, uh, more suppressed is a bigger challenge. And so I think, you know, if, the, if you step back away from the business for a second, if you're a retailer and you think about what it is that your customers need, it's more than the gallon of paint and the, and the roller cover. It is the, uh, the people that can be in the trucks, be out at the job site, doing the work, doing the labor. And that I think more than anything is going to shape where we go is the ability to have uh, the labor needed to actually put the paint up on the wall. 
Well, I agree. That's been an enormous problem for the dealers as well as the painting contractors. I, I don't follow them as closely, but I certainly read about it. And for sure, labor has, has been an enormous problem. And so one of the reasons why I like to have division presidents and CEOs on my podcast is the quality of the research that you guys get is a lot better than you know what dealers get just following along my podcast. What is it that you're seeing? How long do you think that retailers can expect the market to stay as robust or at least robust? I don't know that anything could stay as robust as it's been, but how long are we looking at where we're going to be this busy? Yeah, I think the the normal economic indicators, right? The, the, the high demand, the low supply, supply chain disruption, those things would tell you that it's going to be a long, long, long time. I mean, there's just, you, you almost, you can't see the end to where that is. I think the the added piece now is economy and inflation right. and what is going to happen uh, on those fronts and how is that going to impact this? Is this excess demand, suppressed supply enough to overcome the economic hurdles or are, is there going to be some dampering effect uh, just based off of the economy? And what are the policies? Well, you know, what are the governmental policies? So I think there's more uncertainty than ever. That said, this the demand and the supply, the heightened demand and suppressed supply is so gargantuan that maybe those things aren't important. So, you know, it's this is this is the, the time to pull out your crystal ball mark and really figure out what we should expect. Well, you know, from a macroeconomic standpoint, right, uh, dealers understand that they see Aura now, a dealer was sharing with me the other day, you know, Aura is going to be up upwards of $90 a gallon now. And and their concern was, how much are people going to pay for a gallon of super premium paint, meaning maybe they won't buy something so expensive or put off the, the purchase. But the reality is with everything coming up basically at the same time, at the same rate, it's going to be really interesting to see whether or not that price increase, which would normally suppress demand, is going to have any effect in this environment. Demand seems so excessive. My own opinion is the dealers that I'm speaking with, I'm telling them to hire every person they can get their hands on, and I'm telling them to buy every can of paint and every you know box of caulking that they can get their hands on, because uh, with demand it's seemingly as high as it is, I think we're going to be like this for a little while. You know, we talked a little bit about uh, there being some grace out in the within consumers and and understanding we're all in this together. The challenges that one retailer is having are the same challenges his competitor is having. Same with distribution. Same with 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 manufacturers. And I think it's uh, really critical for all of us not to be lulled by that kind of safety blanket that's over us. So while we're seeing product prices rise, while we're seeing cost of labor going up, and in order to to attract and retain a talented, skilled workforce, we're having to pay more, it's still really important to figure out how to remove cost from the business. Cost of of freight is one of the things that we're looking at all the time. Obviously, as a distributor, that's our largest uh, expense. I think more it's it's always been so, but but even more so now when you have kind of everybody experiencing this inflationary uh, uh, element to figure out how, even as you're inflating, how to maintain and pull those costs down. And so one of the things that I'm very passionate about is how many trucks are going out to any retailer in a various week. The more that you can consolidate your deliveries, the more product you can put on the stop and the fewer stops that you have to get to your store to get that same product, the more cost you're taking out of that supply chain. And so, you know, of course, we hope that the retailers are choosing Emory Jensen as their distribution partner, but I think it's better to choose somebody else and not fragment your, your wallet than to, to try and, and buy from multiple different distributors, try and, and, and spread your spend across multiple. That's just rising the, the overall cost. And while it could be masked today, if you're not figuring out how to, to, to get a handle on that and get those costs down, there's going to come a point where that's going to be exposed. And the ones that do that and figure out how to, in this case, consolidate their spend and, and, and save on the, the freight element are the ones that are going to emerge victorious. 
And so one of the conversations we had as prep for this, Allison, was about what you guys are doing in the digital space. And anybody who follows along with my podcasts or blogs, they, they know I'm spending a lot of time and effort in this space. Why don't we talk a little bit about what's coming for dealers from Emory Jensen here? Sure. So we started building out capabilities around pick, pack, and ship direct to consumer. So we have packing stations in all our distribution centers. We've got folks that are really focused on turning those orders around quickly, getting them out same day, uh, whether it's parcel. And then, so, so we looked at that and we said, well, how do we make that more relevant and more useful, not just for the folks that have a robust online marketplace that they're playing in, but for the brick and mortar stores as well. And there's a couple of things. So one of them is um, building out the capability to, to ship direct to consumer, not just through parcel service, not just UPS, FedEx, uh, US Postal Service, but also LTLs so that you can get larger, you know, if you need to have a pressure washer, get out to an end consumer, having the ability to get that uh, shipped on an LTL. Uh, an LTL is what, please? Uh, on a, a less than truckload. So, you know, gotcha. think about a, a larger uh, palletized goods being able to ship, not just small parcel boxes. So really that opens up the capability for us to ship virtually all of our 100,000 plus SKUs. The next part was figuring out how to um, ensure that product could ship no matter where the consumer was. So the interesting thing about buying online in the digital space is that you could have a store in Connecticut and a customer in Hawaii that are that are transacting. That's right. That's right. And so it wouldn't make sense if, if normally your Connecticut store gets product from our, our Wilton, New York distribution center, let's say, it wouldn't make any sense to use that to ship to Hawaii. I would much rather have that coming out of our Rockland, California location. And so we developed a, a, a mechanism that routes based off of uh, where the consumer is, but also routes based off of where the product is. And so I think, you know, it's been super helpful with everything going on with the pandemic, the entire uh, kind of universe of everything that we have in all of our 15 distribution centers for consumer to buy wherever they are in the country. And then the last part is the freight. So what we found is that there are freight lanes that are maybe not as obvious. So, you know, I said maybe Rockland to, to Hawaii is the best option, but it might not be. It may be Spokane to, to Hawaii, or it may be Prescott Valley, Arizona to Hawaii. There may be different uh, rates depending on what center it's coming out of. And so to have kind of a, 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 a ability to look at where the consumer is, where the product is, and with what the expense of, of getting the product out there is and how to optimize those three elements. And then allowing that one store in Connecticut to not have to think about that. Just place the order. We'll figure out how to get it to the consumer in the most effective and uh, fulfilling way. And so, and so then the kind of the last critical piece, I should, probably is the most critical piece, is making that transaction. So again, there are very savvy online retailers that are able to transact over the internet. They can take payment over the internet and they can communicate their orders electronically to us as the wholesaler. And th that, that's really easy. But there's a lot of brick and mortar stores that don't have that capability. They may be able to show an inventory online on their website, but they can't take payment. Maybe they have a call center or maybe you know, it's somebody within the store that you have to call to actually give the credit card number. Um, or maybe there's an interest in not transacting online, but having the customer come into the store, but then be able to fulfill them, have an extended aisle that's available to them. So we looked at kind of all the different use cases um, and came up with solutions. So for example, if it, let's say you have a call center or, or you have an individual in a back room that's, that's answering the phone and, and taking um, online orders, the, the credit card payment over the phone, put them in a spreadsheet, they can upload that into our website and we can fulfill those orders. Come into the store, we've made it so that you can toggle our website so that it is uh, customer facing and you can place the order right there with a the customer. So imagine you have a, a contractor that has a job site and, and he doesn't have enough room in his truck to, to put the, the sprayer that he actually really wants or maybe you don't have the sprayer he wants within the store. Well, you can go on or maybe he needs a generator for his job site. You can go on to the uh, website, find it, special order it, and we'll drop ship it right to his job site or back to your store, whatever you prefer. So really thinking about how to make as many different options available, no matter kind of what level of sophistication a retailer is around the digital space. 
And it sounds to me like you guys are really trying to use digital to make the delivery process efficient because there's so much money available there. It's interesting to me, you know, a can of paint, 50, 60, $70, maybe to a retail customer uh, of that, that's a relatively inexpensive item of that $70 that you charge. There's probably 10 bucks, you know, built in there for shipping it. It had to be, the raw materials had to be brought to the manufacturer. They had to be put together and then shipped out to a warehouse and then from the warehouse to your store. And then your store sent it to the retail customer or the painter. When you think about as many times as that gallon of paint has been moved, if we can cut two of those out, we've saved a tremendous amount of money. And and hopefully some of that money goes into dealer pockets. Absolutely. That is, that's the whole intent. And then, you know, the other part of course, is that the endless aisle, when we have a hundred thousand plus cues, they don't fit in a typical paint and decorating store, all of them. And so to be able to provide products that the retailer may not even realize are worth pursuing, uh, grills, patio furniture, uh, tools, you know, uh, any of those things, wiring devices for the painter, you know, who doesn't need some switch plate covers, who doesn't need to be able to, you know, maybe have a plumbing fixture um, that they may have damaged through the work on the job site, all of those things, you don't know what you need. And you're not going to sell them often enough that you're going to stock them within the store. Or maybe you don't even realize that there's a demand for them, but to have them available and to be able to to be a a one stop solution uh, for your consumer, I think is very powerful. And it really is what allows the small guy, the independent guy to be on par or even leapfrog over the big boxes out there. And that's really important, I think, for all of us within this space. And particularly now when so many consumers are clearly showing preference for shopping local, whether that is for the economic value, which, you know, sort of I've been pitching that for the entirety of my career, whether that's for the economic value or just to change in people's opinions on how they define the word convenient for them is is almost irrelevant. It's happening. Since it's happening, dealers really need to take advantage. And this digital space is is without a doubt a great way to do that. Yeah. There are so many online shoppers that will tell you they don't like necessarily where they're buying from, but they're still buying from them because of the convenience. Why not make your preferred retailer you know, your local paint store or your independent hardware store or your community lumber yard that that you do have that emotional connection with. What if it was just as convenient to buy from them? You want to enable. One of the things that's changed is two years ago, everybody seemed very comfortable in this country with getting up on a Sunday morning, driving to a big box store and loading up with everything they needed one trip and coming home. Now, everybody seems very comfortable with placing an order online, getting it in a few hours, getting it the next day. And since that's happening, well, what do we need to have everything in the store for? So long as Allison has it in her warehouse and you can get it to my customer the next day, I can sell it without ever touching it. Exactly. Yes. And so what a great opportunity for paint dealers to really expand the footprint in terms of the number of categories that they cover. Absolutely. And as I think owners are thinking about where to take their business model, it's a no risk way to think about what they want to stand for and where they want to go and try some things out. Well, Allison, great. Thank you so much for joining me today. I really appreciate you making the time. Thank you, Mark. It's, uh, it's always fun to talk about this space and, and think about our business. Well, I hope that uh, you'll come back on maybe next year and, and update my listeners again. I'd love to. 